ladies and gentlemen, as we are about to begin, may I request everyone to please settle down. But before we begin with the program proper, may I inform everyone of a few house rules that we need to follow. We need to follow these house rules because the entire program of today's lecture, from the singing of the national anthem, open remarks, introduction of the speaker, Dr. Delos's two-hour lecture, the open forum, and the closing remarks are going to be video recorded by the Athenaeus University Communication and Public Relations Office, or the UC Pro, and the Association of Political Science Organizations of the Philippines, or APSO. This entire event is being video recorded so we can share the lecture and the open forum to political science students of other universities who cannot join with us today. It is important, therefore, that we are in our best behavior. First, we would like to request everyone to turn off your cell phone ringers, that is, put them on silent mode. Second, refrain from going in and out of the room. Third, refrain from talking to your seatmates so as not to bother the other participants around you. And lastly, we enjoin everyone to stay until the end of the program as the organization will be handing out certificates of attendance to those who have completed today's lecture. There will also be photo opportunity after the closing remarks so we hope for your cooperation and attention. Thank you. A pleasant Saturday morning to all of you. I am John Christian Moyana of UP Diliman and a member of UP Politica, an APSOC member organization. And I'm Catherine Farquhar from St. Sebastian College Recoletas and a member of St. Sebastian Political Science Society, also an APSOC member organization. It is our honor to be your masters of ceremonies and moderators for today's much anticipated lecture. To formally begin with the program, we request everyone to rise for the Philippine National Anthem prepared by Ateneo de Manila University. Jr. A pleasant morning to all of you. 
the idea of the ASOP second annual public lecture on political science is for a political science professor to lecture on a topic of pressing national importance to an audience mainly composed of political science majors. The annual public lecture is meant to celebrate the discipline of political science in the Philippines, highlight the discipline's importance in analyzing pressing national issues, and outline the future of Philippine political science. Our first annual public lecture held in UP Diniman in November last year was a success. It featured a lecture critical of the federalism project of the Duterte administration that used the institutional design literature in political science to criticize the project. Impressively, the lecture was attended by close to 200 political science majors from 15 schools from NCR and nearby provinces. In fact, our speaker for last year's first, first annual public lecture, Professor Jean Laksa Pilapil, Assistant Professor of Political Science in UP Diliman is here with us today. I am happy to announce that the second annual public lecture is now even bigger than the first one. Our audience for this year is more than triple, as close to 575 participants registered. The number of schools where the political science majors are coming from has doubled to at least 34 schools some of them coming from as far away as Mindoro, Batangas, and Quezon province. It may be possible this is the biggest ever gathering of political science majors in the Philippines, and we may have just achieved it today. For our speaker for the second annual lecture, we are privileged to have Dr. Benjamin Gerardo T. Tolosa, Jr., Professor of Political Science in this very university the Ateneo de Manila University, where we are holding this lecture. He is also the Associate Dean for the core curriculum for, of the Loyola Schools of Ateneo de Manila. We are deeply grateful to Dr. Tolosa for agreeing, despite his busy schedule, to be our speaker for the second of Annual Public Lecture on Political Science. I am very happy to inform you that Dr. Tolosa was the one who generously offered free of charge that we use this spacious and impressive auditorium, the Ricardo and Dr. Rosita Leong Hall Auditorium for this APSOP lecture. By offering this large auditorium, APSOP was able to invite more participants and accommodate the requests of schools for more participants to attend today's lecture. On behalf of APSOP and the APSOP Public Lecture Secretariat, thank you, Dr. Tolosa for your kindness and generosity. May you serve as a role model to all of us political science students who are looking for someone who can combine sharpness of intellect, deep public co commitment, and political activism, while at the same time maintaining gentleness of spirit and graciousness of character. Today's event would have been impossible without the people working behind the scene. On the side of APSOP, I am Thankful to the hardworking core members of the Acts of Public Lecture Secretariat, to which I am also a part of. I want to thank Ms. Nina Rafanan, Acts of Deputy Secretary General, also Mr. John Christian Liana, Ms. Janine Vismanos, and many more members for juggling on one hand time to study for their final exams, and on the other hand, time to devote to make this a successful event. I am also thankful to the Apps of Board of Trustees, especially to Chief Justice Emeritus Alden Emil Marta de Leon for their support. Last but not the least, on behalf of the association I head, I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to the Apps of Public Lecture, Secretariat's advisor, Professor Christine Torres Pilapil, Assistant Professor of Political Science of UP Diliman for all the invaluable assistance and tireless effort she extended in making this public lecture possible. On the side of Ateneo de Manila's Office of the Associate Dean for the Core Curriculum, I would like to thank Ms. Maria Pilar M. Bigornia and Ms. Jaris Hansi Marzan for all the kind help they have extended to us members of the APSOL 
public lecture secret target and ensure that this lecture will be a success. As the chair of this year's APSOP annual public lecture, allow me now to welcome you all to the second APSOP annual public lecture on political science, which features at, as its speaker, Dr. Tolosa. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor Valia, for that opening remark. Since we have been formally welcomed, we shall first introduce our participants from 14 political science student organizations from 10 universities that comprise the Association of Political Science Organizations of the Philippines. Let us call them in alphabetical order. We start off with the Association of Junior Political Thinkers of the Divine World College, Calapan. Adamson University Political Science Students united in living out its identity of truth, integrity, knowledge, and academic supremacy, and you politica. Aralia University Political Science Student Organization. Politically inclined students, UP Baku. Rizal Technological University Political Science Society. San Sebastian College de Coletos Political Science Society. Deletran Politicos of Colegio de San Juan de Letran. University of the East Political Science Society. University of the Philippines Association of Political Science Majors, UPAPSM. University of the Philippines People Oriented Leadership in the Interest of Community Awareness, UP Politica. University of the Philippines Political Science Society, Polis of UP Manila. University of the Philippines Political Society, UP Polisai. University of the Philippines Samahan sa Agham Pagpolitika UP Sapol and the University of Santa Tomas, the Political Science Forum. We would also like to acknowledge the presence of non-APSOC political science student participants from the following universities. AMA University Aralliano University Manila Aralliano University Pasay Baliwag University Bicol University Cavite State University Centro Escolar University Manila City of Malabon University De La Salle University Das Marinas First City Providential College Our Lady of Peace School Pamantasa ng Lungsod ng Marikina Pamantasa ng Lungsod ng Muntinlupa Philippine Christian University Das Marinas Philippine Christian University Manila Polytechnic University of the Philippines Rizal Technological University Pasig St. Rafael College of Business and Arts in Real Quezon Technological Institute of the Philippines Quezon City University of Batangas University of Caloacan City Universidad de Manila University of Makati and Wesleyan University also, we would like to thank our official media partners for this event. Again, in alphabetical order, TZUP 1602, Kasalika, Green FM, Inquire.net, Inquire Pop, Radio Katipunan, Waza, Pilipinas, and Wananmanila.com. Lastly, we would also like to acknowledge the presence of our student media publications who would cover the event. Manila Collegia, Rebel Pule, Sina, and for the next part of our program, we have bestowed the honor of introducing our distinguished speaker to Ms. Paula Puini D. Bermudez, a political science student from the University of the Ms. Bermudez is the president of the Political Science Society of the University of the East Manila and the fourth associate justice of the third judicial council of APSA. May we call on Ms. Bermudez to introduce the speaker for the second APSA annual public lecture on political science. Good, mor good morning, everyone. It is my honor to introduce our distinguished speaker for today's second APSA annual public lecture on political science. Dr. Benjamin Gerardo Tito Losa Jr. is a professor in the Department of Political Science, School of Social Sciences, at the Neo de Manila University. He is the current associate dean for the core curriculum of the Loyola Schools. He also teaches in the Department of Economics and Development Studies program of the Ateneo de Manila University. He has written and given public presentations on social democracy the challenges of deepening democratic institutions, citizen engagement, and forging generational dialogue towards renewing social-political formation and involvement. 
They enrich his forces in politics and development, global politi politi political economy or governance, the development, economics, and religion and politics. He, has, he, he was the project leader and editor of the book titled Soft Them. Filipino social democracy in the time of turmoil and transition from 1965 to 1995. Dr. Tolosa received his AB in economics honors program Magna Cum Laude from the Ateneo de Manila University. His MA Depo Development Studies from the University of East Anglia as a British Council Scholar and his PhD in Political Science from the University of Minnesota as a Fulbright MacArthur Scholar. To my fellow political science students, professors of political science, students and professor from other disciplines, ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Benjamin Gerardo P. Tolosa Jr. Let's give him a round of applause. Can you think of the 
teams are up, we'll, we'll do it by, by team mode.
choices.
just to show that even if AP had eventually won in the town, uh, the people saw uh, that in Metro Manila, the, the, it seemed that the sentiment was for the opposition. So it was the Lakas Nambayan coalition, uh, which, uh, which was the coalition which challenged the KDL. So,
uh, it had to do with the uh, history lesson about the UAE. The, the last time that the UP won the championship was in 1986. Now, and I, I remember right after UP won the exciting Final Four game no, against, uh, against Adamson. Eh, lumabas na ganito.
could help the German dad is a long-time political science professor at the college and is writing a book about that the mayor of this place was totally the cause of our history and also how many other animals. So, so in that sense, I think 
the exposure to different fields, even if you are political scientists, enables us to understand questions of power and institution much better. So let me let me link you to that. Huh? Then of course the topic itself has to do with our vision uh, or the vision and distinctiveness of Filipino social democracy. Um, Maybe uh, you, you also have courses on uh, comparative political economy or maybe comparative ideology. No, we, we can draw a little from that. Uh, and then, uh, I think more importantly, to look at the distinctiveness of Filipino social democracy and look at its, its periods of, uh, of development. A while ago, I was introduced as uh, having uh, led a project to try to understand Filipino social democracy in the Brunetone. This was uh, a few years ago. Uh, we started it really uh, conceived it almost 10 years ago and uh, published it seven, uh, around seven years ago in a different context. Huh? But I think, are there questions to be learned from that story? And is it something that uh, can still be shared? Huh? Uh, so that learning from its successes and its failures, we can look at the possible challenges to, to, uh, to the situation uh, coming from the history of Filipino social democracy. Okay, let me start with this uh, uh, slide no, on uh, generation storytelling and dialogue. As I said, there is a there is a literature in sociology called the sociology of generations. So it starts with the work of uh, Karl Mannheim and then developed more recently by people like uh, Edmunds and Turner. And he asks questions like this: no? When you say generation, what do you mean? How are generations formed? I think. Your common sense understanding of uh, of generations. Iba madalas siya sabi ng millennials, iba may siya sabi pero may baby boomer generation, may Gen X, may Gen Z, Gen Y, etc. No? Uh, but I think this literature challenges that kind of notion of generations. No? because it says that perhaps more important than age, more important is the experience of particular events, usually very traumatic events, no? like say for example, war, no? World War I, for example, or World War II, or martial law, or the assassination of uh, Nimeo Aquino, or the death of Kian, de Los Santos. No? So, I mean, so traumatic events, but they, they do not necessarily have to do with, with uh, traumatic events. They could be events that are era-defining. Uh, so let's say, for example, in Sinabi Manila, First Quarter Storm, or it's a revolution. Uh, so this can be experiences that lead to a certain kind of worldview for people who experience it. Okay? And therefore the question is, if that is something that is generated based on experience, can it create some kind of collective worldview and also be an instrument for social change? Can you say that in Manila? Hindi dapat siya itumbas sa sa edad ng no? age cohort. Kasi pag ganyan ang ginawa natin, ang madali sabihin, eh, ang tanda mo na eh, it, na, dumaan ka doon sa panahon ng hapon eh, panahon ng Elsa. Uh, kapano pa kami makakarelate sa'yo? Hindi eh, naman namin na uh, naranasan yun. But it's possible for people, in a sense, from different ages, to have actually experience a certain event. For example, even let's say when we talk about Elsa, there were people from different age groups who actually experienced that, not even though they're not the same uh, age uh, generation or age cohort. But the more important thing is that there is a certain kind of shared experience and therefore uh, has potential for action. Now, it's true that uh, certain types of experiences separate one, uh, one generation from, from the past uh, to, and also from from the future, no? because because I experienced, let's say, let's say Ninoy Aquino's death, let's say in 1983, uh, and when I tell stories about that, it's possible that that's something that is not quickly understood by those who did not experience it, whether in the past or in the future. Uh, but the focus need not necessarily be on the gaps, no? uh, because it's possible that as I begin telling stories, let's say Kanina, no, yung uh, hindi ko kinotsyo na ako kanina no? dun sa, dun sa, dun sa video. Ewan ko, bakit niya sinabi yun? No? Basta inapos siya, interview siya. No? But somehow, maybe, he got it from books. No? He got it from videos. Maybe, hopefully, he heard it from me. That, that there are certain kinds of storytelling 
that in some ways unites one particular generation can also in that sense be shared so that people can also uh, resonate with that experience. No? So it, it can create the space for listening to others and also appreciating what has come before and what can, uh, what can follow. Okay? So I think the important point of that literature is that generations and generational consciousness can be forged independent of age. I mean, that is the hope that I have here. No? Ito yung dahilan bakit uh, naglakas ko ba ko na magkaroon na 500 uh, tao dito sa audience sa malaking auditory, tinakamata ko, hindi mapupuno. No? Uh, pero ang galing ng upstop na, na, na puno. But that is the reason why, why I'm here. And I hope this is also the reason why you're, you're here. That it's possible to have some kind of conversation about the past that makes a difference in the present and the future. In that sense, what we, we can have is some kind of generational uh, dialogue uh, through storytelling. So therefore, social change can arise from dialogues across age cohorts. So, mas inatander sa ulito, it's possible for us to, I mean, to come together. It's in, in effect, certainly as a certain kind of generation, if we begin sharing some uh, experiences, even if those experiences are not necessarily primary experiences, but they can be uh, shared uh, through stories. Now, why are commemorations important? Ang pating pa mahalaga na, alimbawa, mayroong commemoration ng uh, pagwagi ng UP sa basketball noong 1986. So, bakit pa commemoration? Eh kasi, minsan-minsan lang nangyayari, di ba? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Now, ang pating pa mahalaga, alimbawa, na binabalitan natin yung, yung uh, ENSO, o bakit yung aking assassination, O bakit ba, alimbawa, sa hindi sa bansa natin, bakit napakahalaga sa Jewish people yung Holocaust? No? At hindi nila kakalimutan yun. No? Sa kanila nang gagaling yung never again. Uh, well, because that's the way that social memory is sustained. Because unless we, we celebrate, we commemorate, it can really be lost. No? Uh, so that's why it's very, very important to share it. And share it repeatedly. Share the stories repeatedly. Any ways that can resonate, because that's the way in which it can really create a sense of a public past that makes a difference in the present. Okay, now, what's the danger of uh, historical revisionism? Sabi ko kanina, it doesn't, sometimes it's not the, it's not the age no? that, that counts. Because it's very possible for people to have lived in the same period, in the same experience, and yet, uh, may have very, very different conceptions of it. No? Uh, and in fact, even if the facts are, are not supported, they can advance a particular view of uh, that experience no? and, and, and tell that particular story. No? Uh, if you remember, uh, when uh, uh, former Senator Marcos campaigned in, 19, in 2016 no, for the Vice Presidency, he was saying, ipaubayan na lang natin sa mga Professor, yung, ano, yung kasaysayan, hindi namin trabaho yan. No? Ang trabaho namin, uh, harapin ng kasalukuyan. No? Um, I think many people challenge that, and he, even here at the Ateneo de Manila, no, there were a group of faculty who came together, and students and, uh, and professionals here, challenging that. No? Uh, because there were questions about, uh, let's say for example, when he said it was a time of peace and progress, no? I think that was challenged. No? Uh, there's a, there's a problem with how he understands the, that, that particular period, that presents that period. There are questions about whether it was a, a golden age or whether the peace was done at the cost of uh, tremendous suffering, for example. And then he sees nothing wrong no, with the historical record. Until now, I think, they have not, uh, they have not acknowledged it. And then, as I said, the problem is that there can really be a delinking of the present from the past. No, when you say, Paubayan na lang natin sa mga profesor, dahil hindi namin trabaho yan. But in fact, what we need to do is to look at how the past informs the present and the future. Now, more recently, if you remember this, that there was an interview with Senator Enrile about what they said, the distortions. Now, I think uh, whether or not you disagree or disagree with it, I think this is a context in which we have to be very, very conscious about how stories are, are told. No? 
Uh, and, and that's why it's very, very important to pay attention to these differences in, uh, in, in commemoration or differences in storytelling. Or this, no? uh, more recently, we, we saw this. Now, do you remember when, uh, I think two years ago, in November, also, that, uh, that there was a burial? Uh, sometimes, uh, the, the opposition uh, to the burial of Marcos in the Libyan and the Bayani was simply presented, and I think oh, many of the challenges to, to Marshall are presented simply as a struggle between families. Uh, because uh, Dilaw Yan or Hindi Dilaw or Marcos versus Aquino families. Now that's, that's a certain kind of interpretation that, that you hear. Or for example, the, the, the justice who ruled on the, on the, on the burial was saying, uh, it's, it's simply uh, a person who here, just like any one of us. No? And uh, while well, it's something like that might have happened, it was just a fact of history. It, but, but really what it did was simply to ask Marcos there was really no significance beyond it. No? Uh, now, I think the, the reason why we are paying attention to it is that uh, what it can do is that it can belittle uh, many of the realities of the past, not the sacrifices of martial victims, uh, and, and therefore the real challenge to us in, in, in storytelling is also truth uh, telling, no? and that we cannot simply move on uh, without truth uh, and justice, it becomes uh, empty, meaningless, and dangerous. Now, which brings me to the, the topic of, uh, of this lecture. No? And ito yung, yung cover page ng uh, libro. Uh, pwede naman yung photocopy, di ba? Pero meron, meron din dito available sa, sa University Press, no? if, if you're interested. But, but, but really, it was, just like I said, no? uh, a project in collective uh, storytelling. In fact, in 2008, when we were talking about this, you know, conceiving it, uh, we said that uh, maybe some of the people who lived through it might, uh, might not uh, survive, no? they may pass on. So it's important to share the stories, just like I said, na para nagkikwento lang ng, ng matanda, o lolo, o ama, o tiyo, no? sa, sa kanyang anak, o ako. No? So there, there's a need for a certain kind of uh, storytelling, collective storytelling. And in fact, this is not my work alone. Right? It's really a work of uh, a, a group of people uh, who came together, look at the oral stories, the oral histories of people, and share them. But I think it's also very important to say that maybe there's something about this that can be shared as a vision and as a movement. Because you might know, for example, uh, since a lot of you, for example, are in, in UP or in, in, in universities, no? uh, in which I think maybe the, when you talk about martial law and the resistance to martial law, usually it's associated with the Communist Party of the Philippines or the National Democratic Front. The, the story, for example, of the social democratic movement is less, uh, less recognized. No? But is there something also to be shared no, in that history? Can it, be, can it also res resonate? Especially from the context of the struggle for democratization in the Philippines. And in fact, that's, that's the, the argument too that I'd like to, to make. You know, that if you look at the history of Filipino social democracy, it cannot be separated from the struggle for democratization. Because if, even if you look at the past, there were efforts, for example, to, let's say, for example, to the extent that part of that history has come out of attempts to live, let's say, the gospel or or, the, or uh, Christian or Catholic social teaching, uh, what is the role of the, the poor? Uh, what, are, what is the place of justice, for example? Or let's say, for example, in a context where Philippine democracy tends to be elitist or oligarchy, you know, what is the need to, what, where is the, the challenge to go beyond? Or let's say, for example, during the time of dictatorship, how was it a struggle, uh, not just to fight dictatorship, but also to extend it so that beyond the dictatorship, there's a continuing challenge, not just to defend democracy, but also to deepen it. No? So you, you've been classic, as I said. Now, this is what I was saying. No? I, I can actually teach a whole semester uh, of uh, comparative political economy, right? And one thing we can do is, is really to look at the place of social democracy also in, in comparative political economic ideology. No? So you probably learned, for example, that liberalism itself 
was a challenge to traditional conservatism. No? It a challenge to absolutism, a challenge also to mercantilism, where liberalism was really a freedom project. No? Freedom was the goal no, for the individual, but freedom in terms of freedom of markets, but also freedom in terms of politics. Now, where's the place of social democracy in here? Uh, of course, liberal democracy at some point would say that uh, in order for them to be freedom, there has to be freedom in terms of private property and also freedom in, uh, in the markets. And that's the context in which you have consent also, not just in the marketplace, but also in the ballot box. Uh, but socialism challenges that, no? and socialism asks, uh, democracy for whom? That's why we said it's not just freedom that socialists talk about, it's also equality. Is there also, for example, inequality in society? So that even if there is uh, the right to vote, chances are the, the results of the voting would also reflect this inequality. Because in the Philippines, it's true uh, and therefore socialists make that case no? and make that argument. But socialists also have divided over the years. No? So for example, you might ask, anong pagkakaiba ng social democracy at anong pagkakaiba niyan sa democratic socialism? Now one way to answer that is to say, look at what is being modified. No? So for example, in, in social democracy, what is being uh, modified is democracy. What kind of democracy? So, if you say you need to move from democracy from the political sphere to the social and economic sphere, you're saying, therefore, that you need a certain kind of social justice or even socialism for democracy to be full. No? So that's why so, uh, social democracy means the fullness of, uh, of, of democracy. But it also can say that there's a limitation uh, and, and the problem when you disregard the achievements of democracy. And, and that is the challenge that has been presented by social democracy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the tradition uh, identified with Marxism, Leninism, and Communism. Uh, and therefore it points out that there is a danger that by pushing for equality, there, let's say in a state where there is one party, a one party system, or a vanguard party, there's a real danger that whatever the achievements of democracy uh, in the liberal context might be sacrificed. No? So I, I won't go into the details of this, but just to try to place where social democracy is. No? Because at some point, so social democracy also gets associated with a certain kind of liberalism. No? That, that uh, liberals themselves realize that in order for the economy to work, and the economy to work efficiently and also equitably, you need the state to intervene. Uh, but social democrats have been fighting for that for some time, and therefore it's at the point where there is state involvement in the direction of addressing poverty and inequality that you have the emergence of some kind of social liberal and social democratic consensus. No? So yung, yung uh, ganyan klaseng pananaw, makita natin kung saan mahanap yung social democracy sa konteksto na ibang ibang ideolohiya o ibang ibang pananaw. No? Of course, you can say that there are others here, probably today there are real challenges coming from that side, uh, and then also, uh, of course, this one is more uh, theoretical, but those who say, for example, that uh, countries in which there was a lot of state involvement uh, to make the uh, economy successful, like say, for example, in Korea or Taiwan, utilize a particular view of the state which has an important role in the economy. Or this is something that I think will be very important in the context of Filipino social democracy uh, because part of uh, the movement really came out of efforts coming from uh, Catholic and Christian traditions to be able to respond to the call of the Gospels and to respond to the call of Catholic social teaching. I agree with more reasons. So, so I won't go into the details of that. I just wanted to place where social democracy is in the context of ideologies. But now, where can we find it in the context of, uh, of the Philippines? 
I think it's very important, and that's the reason why I mentioned the, the Catholic social thought. No? Uh, because in some ways, it's also not the same as uh, European uh, social democracy, which emerged in a context in which it was more anti-clerical or anti-religious. No? And I think part of the reason is that it came out of universities also like the Ateneo de Manila or UST and other Catholic schools in which there was, uh, and maybe because of the, the, the context of the Philippines, in, in which it was very important to respond to the demands of faith. No? So, it was, a, it was a, a distinct characteristic of, uh, of Filipino social democracy. And it also emphasizes this, no? human dignity, the common good, uh, the faith of just justice no? uh, as, a, as, a, as a vision. Now, this is, I think, very, very important. No? I think part of the reason why there is, uh, there is uh, discomfort or even resistance to, let's say, more uh, statist or vanguardist notions of change is that it believes that what you need to do is to empower uh, especially the poor or basic sectors. No? So, so that's why one very, very important tradition is its rootedness in, uh, in people's organizations. That's why, for example, the social development tradition has been very important in the context of Filipino social democracy. And in Ateneo, there is a social development complex, a uh, history of office for social concern and involvement. But I know that in other schools also, you have the equivalent of uh, social development institutions, uh, service learning uh, work, uh, you also have uh, campus ministries, for example, even in the sectarian and non sectarian schools so that look at how questions of uh, responding, let's say, to faith are also linked to questions of justice and organizing. So, so meron ganong classing uh, context. Now, this is what I was saying a while ago. Uh, it looks at socialism as the fullness of democracy and not the negation of democracy. That's why there is a, there is a slogan that's often associated with uh, social democracy. There is no real democracy without socialism, but also no real socialism without, without democracy. Huh? So, so it's both social democratic and at the same time democratic uh, socialism. Huh? So, so of course whether or not that's achieved is, is something else. No, but that's, that's the vision or the, or the goal of, uh, of this kind of a tradition. And then, as I said, it, it does have a history of fighting dictatorship and promoting democratic, inclusive, and sustainable development because of the context in which it, uh, it emerged. No? It starts in the, really develops in the, in the late 60s and the 1970s and gets overtaken by martial law. So the attempt to try to build an alternative was in the context of martial law. So, so that's the reason why it also values the struggle against dictatorship as a valuable struggle and also a real achievement no? once the dictatorship fell. So that's why when there are tendencies to move back to authoritarian rule, many social democrats uh, resisted that no? and, and made common cause with those who uh, promote liberal democracy. But I guess that is also its weakness no? because it has tended to collaborate with uh, liberal democrats in an imperfect democracy. It can easily be mistaken as simply liberal no? or worse, no? oligarchic. Diba minsan hindi na, hindi na makilangan ng mga tao sino ba yung social democrat, sino yung liberal democrat. No? Lahat dilawa. No? Iba ba yung ganong klaseng, ganong klaseng uh, pananam. No? And, and that, that's why it's very, very important also to say that it is really in the context of imperfect democracy and in a context where you're coming from authoritarian rule and perhaps in a context now where the climate is is not very conducive to democracy that, that there is a real challenge to, to, uh, to promote it. Okay, uh, let me just go through ito, uh, yung kwento, and I hope hindi kayo matulog pa dito. Pero, yun yung gusto kong gawin, na magkwento, magpapalabas ako konti mga litrato, at ako sa ako para photo album ng dolo. Pero, palagay ko isang isang pangamaraan din para pakita, no? Uh, yung, yung kasaysayan na ito. And, and I think the hope is that by sharing some of these stories, people can become more aware that there is a, there is a tradition like this. 
and that perhaps it's something that needs to be uh, reinvigorated or, some, or your new generation uh, takes it on as a, as a kind of framework, even if it's not necessarily the same groups. Minsan pagkakausap ko, lalo na yung uh, kausap ko, yung Tigalix Ateneo, no? kasi minsan sinasabi ko sa akin, hindi eh, pa ano, masyado na ating uh, konektado yan sa Ateneo de Manila. Eh, paano naman kung hindi kami Ateneo de Manila? Well, I think it's on one hand, you can say there's a particular history to it. When you talk about Filipino social democracy, Filipino social democracy with the capital uh, S and D, or capital F, F, S, D. No? Uh, and therefore, you associate it with a particular group. But you can also think of it with lower, lower case. No? Uh, Filipino, yes, but it's social democracy in terms of its principles, and therefore those who take it on don't necessarily have to have the same experiences of those who initially developed it. No? So in other words, one can, uh, one can uh, appropriate it no? without necessarily having come from the same experience as those who initially formulated it. But that's the reason why we, we tell stories, so that the stories can have new life no? in, in new people. And that, in a sense, even though we may not come from the same age core, we can share some kind of generational uh, connectivity. If we believe in certain principles and we realize that in terms of movement, we can come together for social change. No? So, so that's, the, that's the context in which I want to, to tell this history, even if you know, medyo malayo, alimbawa, Sa, sa kaisasayan, sa panahon, o kahit dun sa pinanggalingan ng pangalaman. Okay? Uh, there's a part of it that uh, is probably a prehistory to it, no? because it does come out of uh, Catholic social action. Uh, some of the names that will be associated are really associated with, uh, with the church or even with Jesuits no? in the Ateneo de Manila. And it, of course, it, it has to do with the peculiar history of this of the tradition when it developed. So so that's why it's also asso gets associated with Christian democracy initially. And which is the reason why some people also mistake it to be simply Christian democracy. So so kami kami Christian, paano kami paano kami ano, uh, panig dyan, o paano kami uh, mga So but I think that's part of the history, but I think that the, the broader challenge is to see are there elements of it uh, that can connect with other traditions and that can continue beyond its initial history. Now, student activism. No? Yung tanong kanina, yung uh, FQS. No? Hindi free to, ano ba yung sa, factor quotient uh, system. No? First quarter storm. No, the first quarter storm was 1970. No? Because they thought that there would be succeeding uh, events. No? But this, that was the first quarter in uh, January of 1970. But it was important. And when we talk about generations, it's really true that some people identify themselves as the FQS generation. Ako na, ano na, when martial law was declared, uh, ano pa lang ako eh, grade, grade 5. No? So, so hindi, rin, hindi rin ako FQS uh, generation. Kaya lang, those of us who were, who were younger uh, during the late, I mean, during the early years of martial law and became of age in the in the later years of martial law. For example, I graduated from college in the same year that Aquino was assassinated, no? in, in 1983. There was an effort for us to try to connect with people who associated with the FQS generation because we saw that even if we did not have a direct experience of that, there was something to be learned from it. And that's why when you say EDSA generation later on in 1986, it was not just the people who graduated in 1983. It really came together with people who were in the 1970s and maybe even those who were coming from the 1950s. So, it is yung sabi ko nina, no? When you, you say generation, hindi necessarily age cohort. Iba-iba naman yung edad ng mga tao. Eh. Pero, isang generation kasi meron sila nakita na, na common na, na karanasan. No? At pwede rin na yung, yung tao na nabuhay doon, hindi pareho kang nasano. Alibaba, minsan nagtataka ko, di ba si uh, Pangulong Duterte, di ba, nabuhay rin siya ng pangano niya, di ba? Pero ibang iba yung ano niya, di ba? Ibang iba yung pananong niya o karanasan. So it's, it's really possible also to have a very different conception of the same period or the same, the same experience. 
So that's why it's very, very important at some point to also, I mean, fresh out to what is the what is the experience that resonates, how can we form a collectivity, and how can we make it a force for change. And in that sense, it is really inter-age cohort. When you say generations, generations can come together even if those who uh, are part of it did not experience it in a direct way. It can be, it can be, uh, uh, it can be secondary. For example, one very, very, uh, one very, very striking experience for me you know, in 1982, uh, Edgar Hobson was killed. You know? uh, Edgar Hobson used to be president of the Ateneo Student Council in uh, 1970, you know, FQS uh, generation. But at that time, he was uh, he was a moderate, no? Pagka pagka pumunta yan sa UP noon, sila sabi, clerical pasista, no? Yung So, yung ganun, no? But when martial law was declared, because of the available options, eventually he joined the National Democratic Movement and became a ranking leader of the Communist Party of the Philippines, no? And uh, when he died, he was a ranking member of the Communist Party of the Philippines. There was one day that he was waked here at the Ateneo de Manila. No? I, I, I cannot forget no, the, that, uh, that experience. We were college seniors here at the college chapel no, at, the, at the Ateneo de Manila. And we were face to face with that. No? Pero siyempre, hindi naman kami sang ayaw na limbawa no? sa, sa landas na pinahat niya. No? Walimbawa, sa karanasan namin no? hindi namin, hindi tumutugma limbawa. Yung, yung option para sa mas marahas na paraan o kahit yung pananaw ni Bawa Communist Party. And yet there was something about it no, that for us was uh, in a way life-changing because the question was if if this was someone no, who, who was was giving himself no, to, to the country and you did not believe in it, therefore it's incumbent upon you if you do not share all of what you did to also propose something as radical and to commit yourself to something as transformative that he was so, so in a way, it became a, a, a summons or a challenge, no? which I, I suppose is, is part of what we talk about no? when we say, uh, what is it that become the experiences that are not just traumatic, but are really uh, defining of a particular generation. So, that's what I said, but in 1983, the Aquino assassination was no? for us. So, 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 so that, that kind of experience became generational experiences. No? And, and in a sense, it's something that, that needs to be shared, needs to be commemorated precisely, so that it doesn't get lost. So it becomes part of social memory. And, and therefore, if there is revisionism about it, that's the reason why it needs to be challenged. No? If you know that the experience was very, very different from what is being presented. No? So you know, you know, uh, um, okay, so the anti-dictatorship struggle, the late anti-dictatorship struggle, and then collaboration with liberal democracy, and then finally, I guess, some, some questions about the dangers of uh, the, the present context uh, where, where people talk about the liberal, the liberal democracy, not liberal democracy. So I, I'll go through it. Huh? Uh, just, just bear with me, uh, and I hope that the stories also have some kind of uh, meaning or resonance, I, I hope. You, you probably heard of it also, maybe in history books or, or even with, with your parents and grandparents. Okay, you know, Catholic social action uh, can be thought of in, in this context. Now, a lot of them, I think, uh, are actually located on this campus and also the, ca the, the campus that used to be in Padre Fara. You don't know anymore no, that Ateneo used to be in Padre Fara. The Robinson's name, you know, uh, Ateneo campus. Uh, Sa Padre Fara, but, but uh, a lot of the, the events were, were coming out of that. No? Meron naman nakita ang text, no? sabi ito naman ito, yung, uh, yung UP daw, talagang pwede sabihin UP Manila, kasi may talagang UP Manila. Eh, pero yung Ateneo de Manila, nasaan ka sa Manila yung, yung Ateneo? No? Well, of course, ngayon pwede mo sabihin Ateneo de Metro Manila, no? pero meron naman talagang Ateneo de Manila ng araw sa Intramuros, tsaka sa so some of the stories here actually have come out of the, the earlier period, in the 1930s in, in, uh, in Tramuros and, and, and Paraguay. 
Now, the social justice crusade was important no? uh, because it was, it was responding to a context in the Philippines in which there was real inequality, an inequality that was come out of inequality in land ownership. No? Um, one very, very important figure was Father Joseph Mulroy, uh, looking at the encyclicals of, uh, of the popes, no? and, and particularly the more recent encyclicals at that time, uh, Rerum Navarro, for example, or of the Jesuit Advienes, uh, which of course was trying to create an alternative that was distinct both from capitalism and communism. If there's something that you will recognize about Filipino social democracy, there is an attempt to try to create some kind of third way, uh, some kind of third way between, on one hand, uh, capitalism and, and communism. But at the same time, initially, the strategy was to try to recruit the children of the elite. Now, we will see that later on this will change. But initially, the approach was, since the students are coming from the people who have a lot of money, they are very good. They are the ones who are the ones who are the ones who are the ones who are We know, for example, that many of our students are coming out of the traditional political families then. No? So is there a way to create a new generation coming out of these uh, old families? Or even, let's say, some of the owners of business so that you, you can have uh, change in the next generation? Now, that's a kind of strategy that uh, people can think of. No? So that was one kind of strategy that they had thought. Um, again, uh, the Chesterton Evidence Guild also was looking at the role of the land-owning classes to be able to, to, to be responsive you know, to the needs of the farmers. So initially, again, it was looking at the need to address inequality, particularly in the rural areas, but the appeal was an appeal to those who were already uh, in the upper classes of society. Now, it changes. No? It changes with the Institute of Social Order. The Institute of Social Order used to be in uh, Santa Ana, no? like the Shanaki Santa Ana. It's now here. Uh, if, if you look at this uh, part of the campus, uh, and maybe some of you have been there already, the ISO complex, uh, the Institute of Social Order is still here. No? Uh, but the Institute of Social Order was important because it, it created uh, organizations like the Federation of Free Farmers and the Federation of Free Workers. So the, the, the framework or the strategy changes from simply appealing or organizing the elites to really saying that for there to be more substantial change for justice, what is important is that there is, has to have some real organization coming from below. So the strategy changes, not from change from above to change from below in the hope that you also have some meeting of these two groups of people. No? So then classing, then classing uh, still in there. Horacio de la Costa, of course, was uh, uh, a famous Jesuit. Makita niyo yung statue niya dito. No? So, yung, uh, de la Costa Holy is our humanities uh, uh, school. Uh, but he was very, very important no? as the first Filipino uh, provincial or head of the Society of Jesus, but also very uh, much an eminent uh, historian who was, I think, in many ways, also instrumental in, in looking at uh, the challenge of education for justice. So, so by the 1960s, in the, up in the early 1970s, more and more, there was an orientation towards education for justice. If you see uh, Father Hogan, you will see Hogan Hall, dito rin, no? uh, dun pala. Uh, and then there's a room uh, named after Wang Tan, or Johnny Tan. Uh, the founder of uh, the Federation of Free Workers. So, so that it did have some base no? in, in workers' organizations and also a base in farmers' organizations. Because if you look at the history of social democracy in other places, you'll see you know, that the reason why uh, democracy is valued is that democracy is valued as a struggle of the working classes themselves. No? Because they themselves fought for the right to vote. Alimama, no, sa political science, di ba, alam natin na yung universal suffrage, hindi naman talaga universal suffrage kaya ng Delgado, di ba? 
mas kina sinabi ng liberal democracy, karamihan yung sa liberal doon, eh yung may, may ari, di ba? The property owners, or property classes. And then initially, it did not include women, as, as we know. It did not include the uh, blacks, for example. It certainly did not include colonized peoples. No? So, so even the meaning of liberal democracy had to be deepened, even within that tradition. And that's the reason why social democracy indeed sees that the project of extending citizenship is consistent with the project of socialism or democratization, precisely because it is also the struggle of people who have come from below. You know? So I think that is a very, very important insight. So you cannot simply say na, that, uh, for example, sometimes there is a tendency in some traditions to say the democracy that you see is simply elitist. The democracy you see is simply bourgeois, no? bourgeois democracy. Uh, and, and therefore, it's a bourgeois democracy when you have an alternative system, uh, you destroy it. But from another perspective, you can say also that the struggle for democracy was also the struggle of the working classes. And, and, and therefore, to destroy it is also to destroy the achievements of the working class. No? So, so I think that that insight is very, very important from the standpoint of social democracy and democratic socialism. Because the, the term democratic socialism now qualifies what socialism is or should be. Yeah? Because unless it's also democratic, it doesn't also uh, fulfill the, I mean, the vision of, uh, of, of socialism. As, as we you know, realize there are many places that have tried to implement socialism in an undemocratic now, the name of Manglapos uh, is, uh, is important uh, also because of an attempt to try to define a third force. Now, in 1965, during the elections that led to Marcos becoming president, or Marcos versus Pacapagal, Manglapos uh, ran as a third party uh, candidate and then later on also uh, founded the Christian social movement. Now, the, this was important because uh, it did create uh, the young Christian socialists of the Philippines as a kind of youth base of the Christian social movement. Now later on we will see you know, that the Christian social movement is also important in the creation of what became the Filipino Democratic Party or PDP. Uh, so part of it came out of the, the Christian social movement. Of course, what eventually developed in PDP is something that we also need to look at critically, you know, but part of its history was was this uh, history. Huh? And again, it was, it was a realization that um, if democracy is to be real, even in its liberal sense, it has to address questions of inequality, and in this case, the problems of inequality in the agrarian sector, which was dominant at that time, but also the needs of uh, the labor sector in the industrial countries. So this is a ito yung sabi ng photo album. Makikita niyo naman doon sa libro rin ng po kung kung hirap niyo sa libro rin ng bawa. Even ito, akin niyo di ba nila yan? Pero hindi na niyo makikita yung building na yan. No? Robin Robinson sabi ko sa iyo. But 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 uh, this was a this was a a demonstration uh, calling on uh, on on the on the church in the Philippines to be true to the reforms that were being promised in, in Vatican II. So that was an important part of uh, the shift. Huh? Uh, because even, even within the church itself, there was a recognition that it needed to confront the world. Huh? But confronting the world meant confronting a world in which there was a lot of uh, inequality. Alimbawa huh? dito, we celebrated uh, just uh, last month. Huh? And in fact, we had a whole day talks about this. On uh, 1968, you know, there was a group of uh, Athenians uh, who came out with a manifesto saying that the Ateneo has to go down from the hill. You know, yung alma mater yung Ateneo, yung down from the hill. Uh, but it meant not just going down in the sense of uh, moving to the world, but down from the hill meant that there was a real danger that unless there was a change in the nature of education here, what you're producing are people who really dis are disconnected. No? So, so that's why it was saying there's a need for Filipinization. Pero hindi lang Filipinization sa kung sino yung administrador o kung anong hindi ka ginagamit sa pagtuturo. 
Kung magiging totoo ang Pilipinisasyon, kailangan yung mismo pananaw o orientasyon ng mga estudyante ay nakaugan sa, sa karanasan ng karanasan. So that's why it was calling for these kinds of reforms. I'll go very quickly na, to, to this history, but if you look at the if you look at the book, na, there is a whole chapter on uh, kasabi, na, the kapulungan ng mga sandigan ng Pilipinas. And I said, so part of the history comes out of the history of student Catholic action, uh, young Christian socialists of the Philippines. But people were grappling with what kind of framework to use, and you see, for example, that. It borrows a lot, no? even from even from Marxism, no? uh, and even from uh, the strategies associated with what became no? the, the the new Communist Party of the Philippines. It did have an emphasis on the structural problems, and then it was very very strong in terms of community organizing. The work of Saul Alinsky. Roots of Radicals was talking about what community organizers should do. And the one of its uh, uh, premises was also to adopt a more confrontational kind of approach to organizing. Okay? So, so that's why it's very strong in terms of basic sectors. Now, among the social democratic groups, Kasapi did not organize as much here at the Ateneo than it organized, for example, in the u -Belt and was very, very strong among students. Uh, who were much more connected with, with, uh, with in, in the sense, with the realities of the country. So maybe that of us in the uh, context. And then, of course, also organizing a more basic service. Highly confrontational you know, in terms of its mass actions. So this is an example of Kasapi, uh, protesting violence in 1971. Uh, when I looked at this picture you know, from uh, from the early 1971, and, and then, so that, that was happening you know, also at that time. 15-year-old uh, member of the organization from the basic sectors uh, was, uh, was killed you know, by, by the police. Now, Lakas Tiwa was another group uh, which, which became very, very important. Lakas ng Diwa kay Mangi, meron taga FEU. Uh, one, one person who uh, became a, a very important leader here is now someone who I think provides uh, inspiration to the FEU basketball team because I can see him a lot in the yellow. See Ed Garcia. In fact, I was joking him that uh, when I first saw him wearing yellow and green, I said, why? It's like a loyalty. But later on, I, I, once I got beyond my tribalism, I, I saw that it was really a continuation no, of what he was doing even in the even in the 1970s. It identified itself as democratic socialist, but it also stressed the Filipino character of the ideology. No, when I was uh, talking to him about uh, the time when we were writing this book, he was telling me when they formed Lakas Diwa, they were saying there was a need to go back to our Filipino roots. Sabi niya, you red book na ginagamit ng, uh, ng Communist Party or, or Maoist, is, isn't that really foreign? No? Tapos kasi yung hunger and sickle, di ba? Sabi, uh, hindi ba foreign yun? So sabi niya, we needed to create a Filipino uh, social democracy, he said. So yung, yung simbolo nila, yung uh, tambuli, no? yung baba. And then he also said that they wanted to go back also to the tradition of Filipino heroes no? and to try to recover where well, there can be insights from Filipino heroes. And then this is something that comes out again of Catholic uh, social thought. No? Because in the, in the early 1970s, more and more, it was argued that for there to be the fullness of uh, development, it had to be really uh, holistic, right? in the sense that it needed to provide the social, the political, the economic, and the spiritual aspects. Actually, SPES, even though it stands for social, political, economic, and spiritual, also means hope no, in, in Latin. No? So, so spes was a way to uh, talk about hope, but also to talk about a more integral or holistic kind of uh, development. And then, this is something that is also very, very important and a characteristic of uh, these efforts. Again, it realized 
that there was a need for social organization, not just political organization. No? So therefore, more and more, it was not just liberal democracy, and certainly it wanted to go beyond the more elite uh, system of, at that time, pre martial law, two-party system, and to try to create an alternative that went beyond that. Okay, so participatory uh, democracy was, was very important. It talked about personal as well as structural change, no? so that's why it, it, it really did talk about the holistic uh, form of development. And then I think this is very important because it will come back later on. No? Uh, it drew from uh, Gandhi. No? Even the word lakas diwa uh, means a force of the force of the spirit, no? satyagraha. No? So, so. The, the belief that even those who seem to be powerless because they do not confront violence with violence are in the end also very powerful in that powerlessness. No? Uh, and then it learned also from the uh, civil rights movement, Martin Luther King, or the experiences in, in, uh, in, in Latin America, uh, especially Heather Kappa, of, of active nonviolence. I think this this kind of insight will become very important later on, especially as you talk about the EDSA revolution. So, so those groups, Lakas Diwa, Kasapi, the National Union of Students of the Philippines is still existing. At that time, Edgar Hobson was the president of the NUSP. It came together into the, what became the Filipino Social Democratic Front. So it, it, it's not as uh, uh, familiar, for example, as the National Democratic Front. Uh, but there was also an effort to try to create that. Uh, this is Edgar Sia, uh, Plaza Miranda. And uh, at that time, this was, uh, this was protesting uh, and uh, really uh, going against the, at that time, the burning of uh, villages uh, because of uh, political rivalries uh, in Ilocosur. Uh, but it was also a statement against uh, oligarchic families and how they dominated uh, Philippine, Philippine politics. This was uh, from, uh, from prison. No? The Federation of Free Farmers and the Lakas Diwa and other groups came together to protest the, the failure no, of uh, both the Justice Department and, uh, and those who were aligned with landowners to come up with more, much more comprehensive forms of agrarian agrarian change. No? So, so, so that's why uh, they did it, but by camping in, uh, in uh, the, the DOJ and uh, what at that time was the Department also of Agriculture in Manila, they were arrested for it. But the arrest was also a, a way to present resistance. This was the first Diwa no? uh, protesting against the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, no? which was really the prelude to to, to martial law. In, in 1971, this happened. A year later, uh, martial law was declared. Now, another group, now, which is uh, often mentioned in the history of uh, Filipino social democracy, is the PDSP, no? Partido Democratico Socialista in the Philippines. Uh, it came out of the KDSP, which we saw earlier, uh, and then because it included those who uh, were remnants of Kasapi and Takas Diwa. Now, when, when martial law was declared, many people had to go underground. No? So, so when the PDSP was formed, it was really formed in the underground no? because political organizing uh, had been banned. No? But it was very, very important in terms of providing a real vision of uh, the human person. Uh, what was it that we believed in in terms of our, our view of how that the person is in terms of human dignity and its implications in terms of social realities. It developed the minimum and maximum programs no, of, uh, of social democracy and democratic socialism. So, so that's why it defined social democracy as a minimum program and looked at democratic socialism as a maximum program. And then it became more and more uh, important also in terms of establishing ties with other uh, social democratic groups. No? Like, like I said, initially, you might think that the Filipino social democratic groups were much more, let's say, associated, let's say, with, with Christian democracy because of its history and background. But PDSP tried to define itself as social democratic and therefore tried to link up more with uh, 
socialist parties abroad. No? So it was important in terms of defining the identity of Filipino social democrats. Hindi ko alam kung alam niya na, di ba yung uh, pag social democracy, ginagamit yung process, di ba yung the, the, the fist with the, with the rose. No? So that is the symbol of social of the socialist international, and PDSP adopted that as the symbol also of, uh, of Filipino social democracy, therefore associating with international uh, socialism. Now, I think it's important. No? During the time of martial law, there was also uh, openness to armed struggle in PDSP and Kasabi, uh, limited forms of armed struggle. Now, this, now, later on, this would be reassessed, but early on, in some ways, it was like the, the CPP in the sense that it did recognize that there are points at which armed struggle might be uh, needed. It continued uh, its relationship with, uh, with the church and a lot of its recruitment ground were coming out of Catholic institutions. So that's why it was very strong in UST, for example. Uh, it was strong also uh, here, right? Be precisely because of the, of the roots of the, of the movement. And then I think this is very, very important. So if you look at the history of Filipino social democracy, you have to look also at the social development institutions that were providing the base, not just for the, uh, the basic sectors that were being organized, but also for the students that were being formed. Hindi ko alam kung palagi ko meron din kayo mga ganyan, di ba? Na meron sa mga service learning programs, kadalasan may social development institutions na nag-aalaga doon sa mga studyante. So nahuhubog yung mga studyante sa profession ng social development dahil nakikita nila na may nangyayaring ganyan kahit doon sa mismo mga paaralan nila. Alimbawa dito sa atin, yung ganyan nila, dati meron Center for Community Services, tapos napapailalim doon ang bawa yung workers' college or organizing for rural development. At alimbawa, kung sudyante kami, nakikita natin na pwede pala maging profesyon yung social development. So, that kind of rootedness in the basic sectors was very, very important. And so, it strengthened this community. It sharpened skills for mobilization. Now, this is also part of its history. Yung sinasabi ko kanina yung tanong ko, di ba? Yung, ano yung partido, partido o koalisyon na lumaban sa India, na lakas ng bayan o laban, it was really a coalition, a united front coalition that included national democrats and social democrats, but also members of the traditional opposition. Kaya kasama ni Lawa si Ninoy Aquino dun sa, dun sa lakas ng bayan. Pero yung, 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 yung uri ng coalition na ito, mas, mas higit kesa dun sa mga traditional na, na partido. Okay? And then, later on, it uh, also develops a, 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 a feminist organization, uh, and then uh, it's important to also see you know, that even during martial law, you have the emergence of a social democratic party, the Filipino democratic party, or the party of democratic community. Now, this is what I was saying a while ago. Kasapi CSM, Mindanao Alliance, in, which includes, by the way, cooperatives in Mindanao, right? and, and I think it's, this is the reason why PDP has been very strong on Mindanao issues, about including federalism, for example, because of this, this kind of background. Uh, okay? So PDP. Nene uh, Pimintel, for example, is, is very important in right, this tradition. But I think it's also important to recognize the, the uh, distinctive quality you know, or nature of PDP when it also comes together with, with Laban. Uh, Laban was from Metro Manila, PDP was coming out of Visayas and Mindanao, but in order to be able to expand, especially when there are a lot of dominant uh, politicians coming from Metro Manila, they have to bring in the Laban politicians in, uh, in Metro Manila, but that also changes the character of, uh, of PDP Laban. And then, as we know, it becomes more and more a traditional party rather than a, a social democratic party. Now, but initially, it was both a movement and a party. And I remember in the 1980s, it was, it was an exciting thing uh, to, to actually join uh, the Filipino Democratic Party because it had, it had the characteristics not just of a uh, movement, uh, but also the possibilities for engaging uh, politics in the electoral arena. So I think that was important. 
Now, this is a picture, actually comes from Nenebi Mindel's uh, book. No? As I said, when, when uh, there was the interim batas and Pabansa elections in April uh, 7 of, uh, of 1978, uh, the noise barrage the night before showed no, that Metro Manila was in fact uh, in many ways opposition country, but then the results of the election showed the opposite, no? where KBL uh, practically swept uh, the state or swept the state and the KBL state was led by Imelda Marcos. So there was a protest no, after that, and the, the leaders of that uh, protest were all arrested no, in 1978. I don't know if you recognize some people here. This is Joker Arroyo. This is Tito Gilgona here. This is Sokro Drigo. Uh, and then this is Father uh, Archie Tenga no, from, from PDSP. Uh, uh, you'll notice that this is also uh, someone who was not part of the social democratic movement, but was in Bigutan. Uh, at the same time as they were. He did not come in, he was associated with the Communist Party of the PDS. This is uh, the, the convention of the Filipino Democratic Party, uh, and Lorenzo Tanyana, uh, and Aquilino Pimentel, and then uh, again Aquilino Pimentel, and this time the merger of PDP with uh, Milano. Now look at this, no? because this is a segue to the next uh, point that I wanted to make. Uh, this, this was in the Manila International Airport no? on the day that uh, Nino Aquino was assassinated. No? There was a delegation no, from PDP Lapa that was there to, to, to meet him. Of course, uh, he died no, before uh, they were able to welcome him. No? Uh, but it shows, also shows you that, that uh, PDP Lapa no, was associated with with, uh, well, with the movement no, for, for, for change against the Marcos division. Now, let me just try to point this out, no? because the question I asked in the, in the quiz, if you remember, how many days was uh, the Edsa Revolution? No? That was the correct answer, uh, four days. But I wanted to say also that if you really are to really understand uh, the Edsa Revolution, you have to look back, uh, farther back, no? Uh, because there really is a prequel to the EDSA revolution of 1986 and to understand it only as a, an urban uprising of four days is to really misunderstand uh, what was happening. Now, the usual framing of lines of debate or political divisions, well, often when we talk about it, and to a certain extent that was also what I was saying a while ago. Uh, for example, obviously during martial law and even before that, you can say the difference was between the Marcos people and the opposition against Marcos. Now that's one way to, to make the distinction. Or another way was to say, yes, there, then you have the traditional opposition, like the Liberal Party, uh, or, or even maybe later on, even the Nationalista Party was also against the KBL, uh, or even some of the design groups that were, were, uh, were oppositionists. But you can say that there was also a non-traditional opposition. Certainly the CPP was a non-traditional opposition, but you could also say that the social democratic groups were a non-traditional opposition. And then among the non-traditional opposition, you can make a distinction between national democrats versus social democrats. Also sometimes that's the, that's the kind of lines of debate that is usually presented when you talk about political divisions or ideological divisions. The Aquino assassination, however, changes that. No? And that's the reason why it's important as a prequel to the Edsa Revolution. Because after August 21, it becomes important in terms of looking at the form of change. But not just the form of change, but also the principles behind the strategy of change. So by that time, for example, it becomes very important to ask whether the response to the dictatorship will come about in time in terms of if it's violent, would the change also be violent? Or could there be active non-violence to confront the dictatorship? That was very, very important after 1983. And I think it will be very important in terms of understanding how was it possible to have a non-violent revolution in 1986. But I guess also the, the context in which it also creates it, its own weaknesses no, later on. But the, it was very, very important to view it in this kind of lens. That it was not just this kind of division that was uh, uh, important or eminent or prominent.
but also this kind of distinction. Because, as I was pointing out, there was a division even among social democrats. And because there were social democrats who had decided also to go uh, on, the, on the way of armed struggle. For example, the Kasapi group at some point developed its own armed group. No? The April 6th liberation movement, for example, was an urban uh, armed group. Or PDSP also had its uh, Sandigan army. Of course, it never really achieved the kind of uh, expansion that the NPA had. But you see that even within social democrats, you know, there was that kind of openness to arm change. But after uh, 1983, there was an emergent uh, development you know, within, within uh, even the social democratic groups to say that perhaps that was not the way to go, you know, that this, this was creating a space for a different kind of change. Okay? Of course, it has its roots in pre-1972 activism. I was talking about La Asdiwa and its uh, Gandhian uh, framework, for example, and it's also roots in uh, some of the work in Martin Luther King, for example, or in Latin America. So it did have roots before Marshall. Now, this is also very, very important. And I think it's important even when we understand Marshall. Usually, when we talk about the resistance to martial law, what is celebrated is the armed struggle. Iba yung yung bantayo, the mga bayani, no karamihan. Uh, of course, naturally, those who were the most uh, oppressed or repressed by the Marcos regime were the ones who opted to go underground and to engage in armed struggle. No? But I think it also misses an important part of the story. If you simply focus on the armed resistance against martial law. Because there were many groups also that remained above ground and got into, for example, social development organizing initially. In fact, initially because they had to operate above ground, their strategy or their framework could not be openly political immediately. Because if you if you did so, you would be immediately arrested. So a lot of this engaged in work that might be called social development or social justice work. But of course, at some point, you also could not separate social justice work from, from political work. I remember, for example, uh, I was a member of the Office for Social Concern and Involvement. No, we, we used to have our office here. No? Uh, I was in second year college. One day, for example, uh, when, when I went to our office, I saw that uh, our office had been raided no, by, by the military. All our project officers had been uh, arrested. At some point, you could not separate even social justice work from, uh, from, from, political, from political work. But initially, it was, it was work that was doing uh, social organizing among basic sectors. But at some point, we were being uh, challenged to, to see how, for example, the work for social justice could also not be separated from, from the work for democratization, which was much more political in form. No? So, and I think the, the Aquino assassination, in a, in a sense, provided that context because now you have the possibility for above-ground resistance against the, against the dictatorship. So, so I think that was very, very important. So this was what I was saying a while ago, since we are in the Ateneo right now. Uh, the down from the hill uh, call, for example, for Filipinization was important in terms of transforming the nature of the education here, but also to say that if we wanted to, uh, if we wanted to engage in the work for social justice, you also have to diversify the population here, uh, which therefore meant that you had to open up uh, the university to more scholarships. No? So, so this this was this was part of the transformations that, that was taking place. I don't. Know. Of course, this is an iconic image. No? of the Aquino assassination. And when I was talking about traumatic experience, which defines a generation, as I, I told you, I graduated in 1983. No? Uh, this was 1983, August uh, 21, 1983. It becomes an uh, iconic symbol. No? So, hindi mo pwede sabihin lang na, di ba, Dilawan o Marcos family versus Aquino family. Now, it had to do with, uh, at some point, what, what was it calling you to do in a context where there was continuing repression. If you're working for social justice, uh, at some point, can you not also uh, 
work for, for political change. So, so I think that was what confronted many people. I don't know if you've seen no, this, this photo. Uh, Aurora Aquino, no, the mother of Ninoy Aquino, refused no, to, to dress up and clean uh, Ninoy Aquino. No? Uh, sabi niya, we want the people to see how, how brutalized he was. No? Uh, how he looked no, when, uh, when he was assassinated. So yung itsura niya dun sa babao, ayan. No? Uh, and uh, ang inyo nakita no, dun sa time stream, no? na nagpunta yung mga tao, tapos nung nilipat sa Santo Domingo, yan yung pimahan na, na nakita. This was uh, characteristic, no? uh, a, a real expression of the time. Hindi ka nag-iisa. Now, hindi ka nag-iisa could mean simply condoling, di ba? Pwede hindi ka nag-iisa, nakikisa kami sa iyo o sa lupot ng pamilya mo. But I think it's important that later on it becomes uh, much more meaningful in a different sort of way. Hindi ka nag-iisa, hindi tayo nag-iisa, magkasama tayo. No? So, there is a term for it that later on emerged right, in the try, in attempt to try to understand what was happening from 1983 to 1986. No? That hindi ka nag meant uh, a kind of disclosure story. Disclosure in the sense that there was someone who was providing testimony. In fact, sometimes it's probably more important to think of the assassination as more martyrdom, which means really self-giving and testimony and witness. Because of that witness, there is a summons to ask you, ano gagawin mo ngayon ang pagginawa ng mga ibang to? So, a disclosure story, therefore, is a story that challenges you to also take up the challenge to, to give of yourself if someone else has also given of himself. And then, if others are also giving of, him, of themselves, aren't we all asked to give of ourselves? You know, in a sense, I think that's a way to understand Edsa. Uh, spontaneous na na ba yun? Huh? O nasa Metro Manila lang ba? But I think what is important there is that when you saw other people there, it was also a summons to you, not to say, ano yung ginagawa ko? Hindi ba ako diba dapat tutugod na kahit na natatakot ako? So, I think that was very, very important in terms of understanding what was happening. Again, that's the image. Uh, this was the one million huh? uh, people who participated in the funeral. Ayan. Ross Bolivar yan. This one, I, this is important no, because later on it was asked, it was not just justice for, for Aquino that was important. No? It was also justice for all victims of, of martial law. No? So that's why from the standpoint even of the Communist Party of the Philippines National Democratic Front, it included Bobby de la Paz, Edgar Hobson, uh, Juan Escandor, uh, McLean Dula, the, the justice for Aquino, justice for all, was an effect, uh, an effort to try to build a coalition for change. Uh, again, this is uh, during the, the funeral. Now, this picture, I think, is very, very important because it's, if you notice, it passes by Luneta. This is the coffin of uh, Ninoy Aquino. And this picture connects Jose Rizal no, with uh, with Nino Aquino. Therefore, that, that image is very, very important to that generation no? that experienced it. And I think this is part of the story also that needs to be told. Because at some point, people thought we're looking for heroes. No? But can, also, can there also be a hero for active nonviolence? Earlier, I was telling you that for me, the encounter with uh, Edgar Hobson's uh, body, brutalized also, no? just like Nina Aquino, uh, in, in the Ateneo, was very, very important in my case, no? as a college senior, when that happened no? in 1982. But part of the questioning that was taking place in me at that time was to say, eh, paano yun? Hindi naman, hindi naman ako komunista, no? hindi naman, hindi rin parang tumutugma yung, yung landas na, na pinili niya no? sa gusto ko. Pero sabi ko nga, Kung, kung gano'n ang sagot mo, kailangan meron ka rin sagot na iba, no? Kasi kung may nagtataya, hindi ka rin pamataya. But in a sense that the Aquino assassination provided that new kind of space because now you have uh, the opportunity to, to think about 
uh, the possibilities for, for active nonviolence. So, so, so I think that was very, very important in this context. So it created, it created the conditions for nonviolent uh, people power. So, so in other words, EDSA is not just for this. You can say it comes out of 1983, but, but it also has roots from an earlier period. Um, I have a copy of the undelivered speech of uh, Nina Aquino prepared a speech no? uh, upon arrival uh, in uh, Manila International Airport. Of course, he was never able to, to read it. No? But here's what he was going to say. No? Uh, he said, I never saw nor have I been given assurances or promise of leniency by the regime. I returned voluntarily armed only with a clear conscience and fortified in the faith that in the end justice would emerge triumphant. According to Gandhi, the willing sacrifice of the innocent is the most powerful answer to insolent tyranny that has yet been conceived by God and human beings. Okay, to his statement again. That became very, very important no, for, for the generation no, that, that, uh, that experienced it. No, so, in other words, it is not just an act of violence that we felt in it. What he was providing was a witness. It was self-giving. No? In fact, it is more important to think of it, therefore, as that self-giving rather than an act of violence on him, because later on, that act of violence transforms into a commitment for change. That's why for us, para masakit pag sinasabing dilawan na lang, because yellow, in fact, was a symbol of this, of this resistance no, to this regime. Of course, it has a corny uh, no, origin, no? kasi nga yung uh, kanta tayo yellow ribbon, no? yung pag... Uh, Pero it became a symbol of protest. No? Because if you say that hindi ka nag-iisa, kasama kami, nakikiisa kami, you wear yellow. And therefore, to denigrate it now is, is really painful, I think, for, for the generation that looked at it this way. Okay, so hindi ka nag-iisa has to do with that, not just popular outrage, it also meant that there was a renewal of organizations and also an expansion of democratic space. So, so, so this was very, very important in terms of creating the, the basis for change. Uh, now, there are other groups. No? Jose Blanco was associated with Kasabi, but by 19, the 1980s, he was associated with a group called the ACAPCA, or the uh, Alianza Pansapayapan at Katarungan, no? uh, which advocated active nonviolence or allied Damag. Ali Damal was, a, was a, a kind of framework and, and strategy that said to respond no, even to oppressors, the most effective kind of response is a response that actually recognizes that there's a dignity even the oppressor, but, it, but really challenging the oppressor to look at you as an equal. I'll give you an example. Diba? But that means uh, Biblia, no? diba? when someone hates you, on the, on the, on the, when someone hits you on the right, turn, turn the left as well. Does that mean that, that Jesus is asking one to be submissive? You just turn the other cheek. There's a reflection on that and say, actually, the time na yun, ang panahon ni Jesus Christo, pagka yung superior, let's say Roman, hitting a, hitting a Jew, Pagka ang equal, ang pag, ang pag, uh, pagsampal, pagganito. Pagganito. So, pag kinampal ka ganun, patama ka dito. If you turn, if you turn the, the other cheek, what you're forcing the person to do is to hit you this way. Hindi ganun. Kasi kung, kung ganito, you are below me. Pagka nagpatira ka ng pagganito, dito ka. Ibig sabihin, you, I am your equal. And therefore, you have to respect my dignity. And I challenge you to do that. And I will not respond in the same way, but you have to respect my dignity. So, so in other words, the man important. I like the man. And therefore, it is that power of powerlessness that makes possible this, this kind of framework. So, I like the man. And then, it becomes important even within church groups that initially we're also considering 
uh, our struggle. But again, one very, very important uh, statement was the post-election uh, statement of the, of the bishops. No? Uh, that became very, very important. Uh, they were saying, according to a government that assumes or retains power through fraudulent means, has no moral basis. Okay? And then, at the same time, they are saying, the way to uh, indicate to us now is the way of nonviolent struggle for justice. So, even from the point of view of, of the church by that time, it moves in the direction of active nonviolence. Now, within the social democratic movement, there were efforts to, as I said, create alliances. No? Among them, justice for all, justice for all. Uh, justice for Aquino, Justice for All, which was an attempt to try to bring together different groups from a wide spectrum. COMPIL was another uh, effort to try to address the 1984 constitution, and how, I mean, the 1984 elections and how to address that. Uh, Filipino Social Democratic Movement was um, an attempt to try to bring together different groups in the social democratic tradition, like ASAPI, PDSP, and what later on became Mandaya. The Banu Alianza Makabayan was initially an effort at United Front. But when it became clear that it was going to be dominated by just one group, uh, other groups uh, split from it and created another group, the Bandila, which now becomes part of the, of the, the Ed's uh, uh, movement. So, the Parliament of the Streets, this was the Dispersal at Welcome Rotonda, uh, that's uh, Lorenzo Tanyana, uh, Renée Saguizar, uh, Ed Garcia, uh, uh, Frank Chavez on the right. This is USC, right? Ateneo uh, students uh, uh, marching to Iwasa Bonifacio in 1984. That is the Youth for the Advancement of Faith and Justice. Uh, a lot of it were coming out of USC. This was the uh, March of Bandila when, uh, when we marched from Santo Domingo to, to, to Makati in, in the rain in uh, August 21, uh, 1985. Then, of course, part, part of the history is the, the way it uh, segued into electoral struggle. So that was part of the story, you know, that, that even though we saw that uh, elections were probably not going to lead to genuine change, Participation in the elections was also a way of organizing and was a way also of uh, challenging markets. So people getting involved in electoral struggle, protecting the ballot, and then eventually challenging the results of that election. But this was the Tagumpay uh, Nambayan uh, rally uh, that, that, that challenged the outcome of the election, and then leading to the Ed's uh, revolution, uh, which was therefore not a military, not just a military coup. Uh, in some ways, it was triggered by that. But if not for the movement that had been taking place for some years, it would not have achieved that kind of character. Imagine Ed's son in, uh, in 1986. Then, of course, the the swearing in of uh, Oriol Kino, even at the time when Marcos was still in. Okay? Now, let me just go quickly you know, to this uh, uh, later period, you know, from 1986 to, to the present. You know? One of the groups that had roots in the social development groups, uh, in social, social development agencies or institutes, uh, social development professionals, some were coming out of PDSP, uh, but also students and academics, uh, was the formation of Pandaya, no? Pandaya for the Socialist of Filipinas. Uh, it was important in terms of adopting a, a view of the state uh, that could be penetrated or transformed, uh, in, in some ways coming out of also a recognition of some of the insights of Marxism, uh, but from a strongly humanistic and even Christian framework. Right? And then also took on the programs of PDSP, but again, a very high level of commitment to basic sectors and a high level of uh, commitment to political and personal ethics. And it was 
committed to African violence because it was coming out of that uh, experience, especially in the 19th century. Uh, was the first chair of uh, Andaya. Uh, this, this was uh, the, the call for comprehensive people's agrarian reform, uh, CIPAR, and then also um, work that uh, was linked with the uh, Chico Chito Gascon uh, was, was an important figure. Now, you don't know if you know no, that uh, since Marami Nipirito, Chito Gaston was uh, chair of the UP Student Council. Pero ang joke noon, bakit daw nung nalala si Chito sa UP, bakit ang celebration dito sa akin ay nalala? Well, part of the reason was that many of his friends and, and, and organizers were coming from here and also because of the history of the Filipino Social Democratic Movement. But, but it's also very important to see him as part of the framers of the 1987 Constitution. He was the youth rep in 1986-87. And then, this is, I think, one of the dilemmas of electoral politics. Huh? Like, Bochabad, uh, he joins the Liberal Party. Uh, in recognition that you, you need space in the formal democratic sphere. But at the same time, creating all sorts of dilemmas once you join a, a traditional political party, huh? like the, the, the Liberal Party. I don't know if you rec oh, sorry. recognize this person right here. That's Rizal Guilleros. A lot of work was important in terms of coalition building. Uh, as I said, by 1986, the challenge was, on one hand, to defend democracy, because there were a lot of challenges from both right and left. But there was also a challenge of how do you create alternatives uh, so that there is uh, a deepening of democracy? Uh, so there were efforts at building alliances and coalitions that would push for certain reforms. Now, later on, uh, what emerges as a buy-in comes out of one social democratic tradition, uh, and dying, but also groups that were more associated with independent uh, socialists, not like DC and then the M MPD and uh, those who split from the Communist Party would come together in uh, a pilot. Of course, we know that it's a continuing history uh, present. Well, some successes. No? Uh, I think the 1987 Constitution is, is part of what you might say as a success. No? People like Chito and and Ed Garcia were, were part of the framing of the Constitution. Uh, comprehensive agrarian reform law uh, with all its weaknesses. Of course, the more comprehensive one was not really the one that was legislated, but you, you can see you know, that there was some of it that uh, could be pursued further. The Urban Development and Housing Act, the Social Reform Act of the late 90s, 2000s. Some positions in the bureaucracy, like uh, Pasapi people getting into local uh, government positions. Uh, Gin Dennis, uh, more associated with uh, Pasapi because of her husband, uh, but more independent as a social democrat, was instrumental right, in the, in the uh, drafting of what is now the, the uh, more basic law. Buchabag uh, as uh, budget secretary uh, was important in terms of creating uh, efforts at uh, greater participation in the budget. Chito Gascon remains as uh, the chairman of the commission. Now, what are failures? Huh? As I pointed out, the real dilemmas of uh, electoral politics. Huh? What has happened to, to PDP Laban? Uh, the real dangers of uh, cooptation, and even Mandalin in terms of uh, participating in the Liberal Party, right? in, in its ability to actually try to transform it. Because initially, the strategy was if you enter traditional political parties, it may be possible to transform it. So I think part of the dilemma today is still how do you create a real 
uh, basis or correlation for social democracy. Of course, ambayan is there, but can one extend that from the young ambayan to other uh, political parties or politicians? Okay. Failure to use positions in the bureaucracy. No? Uh, also, I think this is part of the realization. Right? Even those who went into the Aquino government from 2010 to 2016, and probably the reason why we're having this kind of dilemma today is that there was also a real failure to push for far-reaching changes. And then, a continued challenge. Now, how do you build a solid social democratic movement that, that will survive? Probably there is a lack of a strategic plan. Even social development professionals became more uh, professional and then less, uh, less uh, involved in organizing. At some point, there was a question whether the social organizing was, was leading to uh, political organizing. So that's why people were thinking about, can you link social development with governance, but also with politics? Uh, and, and that's something that is still not uh, solved. Huh? Drying up of funds for political education. I think this is something that uh, is a real challenge even today. In right? our schools, how do you continue political education? But hopefully something like this is uh, part of the political education. Real crisis, even internationally. Huh? Uh, uh, you, you, you find, for example, that in many places in Europe, it's the conservative parties that are winning, even Latin America, uh, we're seeing that now in the university. Well, some things to consider. Uh, perhaps there is a, we're in a context in no, which there is a global decline, not just of the democratic left, but even of the liberal center, no, the, the rise of uh, Authoritarian politics is something that we have to deal with. Uh, the consensus that developed maybe in the 1980s is, is something that we need to reconstruct no? and needs to reemerge. In a way, it's a crisis of liberal democracy, but to the extent that social democrats believe that social democracy has to be built on liberal democracy, we really have to engage. Uh, with the problems of liberal democracy itself, right? especially if liberal democracy is not really liberal democracy, right? if it's very much rooted in a much more oligarchic system. But what are some of the continuing challenges? Now, I think, as I said, the challenge is to be able to link the commitment to human development with uh, politics and government. Right now, I think the, the challenge is to engage uh, a context in which uh, there is violence and with, in which there is uh, legitimization of uh, well, sometimes where rule of law can even be used as a weapon. Uh, how do you harness the networks for greater accountability and reform? How do you create or how do you uh, perhaps build a new uh, forms of uh, organizing, especially if the roots of this tradition have come out of the community organizing. How do you also address you know, the need for basic services delivery, especially if there's a real need to, to do this in the context of uh, present poverty? Now, this is something that I wanted to say, but because if you look at the history of Filipino social democracy, a lot of it has come out of the youth. So is there something that can be created or recreated among young people today? So. Uh, the importance of youth leadership. You engagement people, you in a sense I think a real willingness to, to look at perspectives and to organize is something uh, that we need to look at. Of course, the importance of mentoring you know, and, and uh, formation is something that we who are involved in political education work have to pay attention to. Of course, we have to ask what are new forms of organizing that are much more creative. Uh, can one create new core groups no? uh, that can build uh, successor generations? Now, how do we promote generational dialogue for social change? Sana medyo nakatulong ako dito sa ganitong klase ng pagkwento. But I think what we need to do is, what is the basis for a new kind of collective consciousness? Are there disclosure stories that can inspire us? No? Uh, 
uh, today that can link generations together, but especially young people. And then to see that uh, this uh, struggle is really an unfinished uh, struggle for democratization. Let me just end with this quote. Right? It's really uh, a quote that I myself uh, wrote right? in, the, in the book. It, the, the book of them ends this way. Uh, for all the failures no? and for all the institutions and uh, efforts that have not survived, in many ways I think it's a real dilemma to talk about Filipino social democracy in which there is no real full development of Filipino social democracy to present it as an alternative uh, because it is a living tradition. No? Uh, and the hope is that it is not just embodied in the people and institutions that have been formed by its social vision and practice, but that there will also be people who will be willing to learn from this experience and to take up the challenge to continue this journey. Thank you very much, Dr. Donosta, for the truly massive and enlightening lecture on the existing struggle for democratization in the Philippine context and providing for a call to action for our present generation. Thank you as well to our participants for patiently listening to Dr. Donosta's lecture. We hope that you have realized how important it is to learn how, how indispensable it is to know the democratization struggles in the past in order to understand better the democratization struggles we now face as young political science majors. But before we go to the next part of our program, the organizers would like to first thank our two sponsors for the modest refreshment that will be served after our event. Absol would like to thank Manila Empanada, the best tasting empanada in all of Manila, for their empanada. Absol invites and encourages everyone to visit and like their Facebook page Oh, Manila Empanada. Manila Empanada is open to franchising and catering services, so just contact them if you are interested. Apso would also like to thank Sure Save Pharmacy and Binimar for the cupcakes and providing 500 pieces of bottled water. Sure Save Pharmacy and Minimar is located near the Atenea de Manila University. You can find the store in the Leonor building, Saver Bill, Avenue Dorola Heights, and Sensitive. Our next part of the program is the open forum. But before we open the floor for discussion, here are some reminders on how we will run the open forum. In order to democratize access and to enable more students and guests to participate in the open forum, we will strictly impose the rule of one question per participant and we will not allow any follow-up question. We will also entertain one question at a time so that Dr. Tolosa can concentrate in answering it before another participant can ask a question. We request that your question be brief and to the point, and you can speak in any language you're most comfortable of, maybe in English, in Filipino, or a combination of both. And also, before you ask your question, please state your first name, your organizational affiliation, if you have one, and the university or school you come from. Also, in the interest of fairness, our format and building questions, we will be entertaining one participant's question from each side, from each of the three sides. First question will be from the left side, second will be from the center, third will be from the right side of the auditorium, and then on the back of the same format. So, we are now ready to accept questions from the floor. Anyone? From the left side of the auditorium. The first time that you saw this was that of uh, the gentleman the end of the auditorium. So please come forward. Please state your name, your organizational affiliation, and the university you come from. Thank you. So, good morning, Dr. Talasa. So, I just want to ask, recently, um, I am Daniela Ibrahim, Jr. from University of Days Political Science Society. So, 
So recently, the armed forces of the Philippines declared that at least 16 Metro Manila schools are training grounds of communist innuendo, and that students are being influenced and trained by the communists to revolt against government. Hence, creating a stigma or a red scare among the students who exercise student activism having several important issues, problems confronting their country. So my question, sir, is what is your mind in what is called red baiting or red tagging with the government and that, how does it affect our democracy? Thank you. Well, first of all, I think part of the problem there is that it doesn't distinguish sometimes among, among, among different groups. You know, so sometimes I think maybe there's a need also to have some kind of uh, comparative ideology or political spectrum. I've seen some of the work that uh, sometimes they, they, they do not uh, distinguish among groups. You know, so in, in a sense, I mean, repression is certainly uh, certainly something that we, that we should fight. Um, and then I think at the same time, one, one also needs to uh, become clear also you know, what, what we do stand for. So that's why among students, uh, there, there is a need, therefore, to, to be clear to you know, what we stand for and what we organize for. So, so that's why I think that's part of the reason why, why I hope you know, that you invited me to present also alternative perspectives on possibilities for change. You know? so, so, so that's why I think in, in terms of creating alternatives, it's important to be aware of what the, the different options are. But, but certainly I think it's, uh, I would be very much against any kind of, uh, any kind of repression. And at the same time, I think what, what is needed is to become much more conscious of this deepness, what, what kinds of alternatives are being proposed, and what kinds of organizations are necessary to be able to respond to it. For the next question, yes, from the Hello, I'm Charisma from Political Inclined Students of University of the Philippines, Baguio. So, Michael Mann is a scholar who focuses on social power and as well as authoritative, authoritarian regimes argues that one of the tenets of authoritarianism is the monopoly of the authoritative binding rulemaking uh, backed up by the uh, monopoly of the, of the means of physical violence. So, in the Philippines today, with the terrorists of Plantok Hang, uh, where thousands of people have already died, which uh, establishes the fact that Duterte possesses the monopoly of the means of uh, physical violence. In addition, a uh, democratic institution, as well as critics of Duterte, have been pushed aside. Let's take, for example, um, Chief Justice Maria Lourdes Sireno, who was ousted uh, through a co co plea without undergoing uh, impeachment proceedings. So, my question is, uh, um, is the Philippines, I mean, is authoritarianism um, leading its ugly head towards the Philippines? Or, or in other words, uh, is the Philippines leading away from democracy? Well, I think there's a, there's a real uh, danger of that, uh, that, is, that is happening. And, and, and I think part of, part of since, since uh, some of these are, are, are not things that we can fully control, you know, so I think part of it also has to do with, with us and, and, and how we respond you know, to, to instances where uh, even rule of law is being used as a weapon. You know, but being used as a weapon for sometimes very personalistic ends. No? Uh, and sometimes, I, I don't know, some of us get, uh, I don't know, get attracted to, to personalism, but the personalism that has institutional implications. No? So that's why I was saying that at some point we also have to think about how we respond to, to, to that. No? Uh, but at the same time, I think one also has to recognize that some, sometimes what uh, authoritarian populists are able to build on is a real resentment also from people who have been uh, dispossessed. No? Sometimes the, the narrative that this is uh, this is the elite no, versus the, the people, of course, you also have different elites, no? but, but sometimes that's the way it's been presented. You know, you know, uh, you know, and, and the 
authoritarians present themselves as, uh, as for the people. And yet we realize that those who are most affected and uh, even killed in, in this are often the, the poor people. So, so that's why I think it, it needs to be challenged. Uh, part of the challenging of it also has to do, I guess, with, uh, with challenging the kind of uh, legitimization of violence uh, that, uh, that we see. That's why I, I thought that the, the narrative of active nonviolence is something that we may have to recover. But when, when we talk about the commemorations are important. Uh, that's, that's why I think you, we have to fight any efforts to simply denigrate it. Because it's it's not just Nino Aquino, it, it was the way in which the people themselves responded to to uh, a, a call to, to to respond to violence with with nonviolence. Uh, and, and therefore emphasizing the importance of, of human dignity. Kaya yun ang hindi dapat ano eh, parang palitin no? uh, yung, yung pagpapahalaga sa tangal ng tao. No? And, and that is the one that is being most uh, challenged sometimes. No? So, and, so kultura yun, di ba? So kultura yun. And, pero yung kultura may epekto sa, sa politika. For the next question. Good morning, my name is Alan Kisburan from the Hasan Universitas Marinas Political Science Program Council. Uh, with the recent events happening or occurring simultaneously, such as the election of the Brazilian far-right candidate Hamid Haile Bolsonaro, the so-called Yellow Vest protests in France, and increasing repression of the Duterte regime. Um, thinking ko, sir, I think the absence of any critique of the economic system within the social democratic framework may be the, old, may be the undoing of such a framework in the first place, of humanizing, of democratizing, etc. Uh, from your perspective, or from your thought, should we consider a reorientation ng mga ideologies natin, ng mga concepts natin, on a general critique of the economic system, which is global, which is a neoliberal capitalist frame of exploitation, of oppression, in order for us to properly democratize and properly attain an alternative that is distinct from the usual conservative, fascist, capitalist, and liberal perspectives that we have today. I am just interested in your thoughts and perspectives. There are critiques of the economic system. I don't know if program or massive program, but if they have a it did have a, a critique you know, of, uh, of structures, you know, including inequalities and in capitalism. But you're right in the sense that uh, the analysis of capitalism has to go beyond the analysis of domestic capitalism to an understanding of uh, the way international capitalism has evolved. And I, I think part of, the, part of the challenge is that because of the way cap capitalism has evolved, it is more difficult to organize the way it used to organize. You know? That the social democratic groups were organizing in factories, but, but now that you have uh, I mean, you have production being spread all over the world, it's much harder to do that. Now I think I suppose you say some the lack of critique has to a certain extent applies to social democratic parties in the West. You know? uh, I, I think the critique that uh, has been made is that uh, let's say the Labour Party under Tony Blair, for example. Maybe the Socialist Party in France, in many ways, reconciled themselves you know, with, with uh, neoliberalism, and, and to a certain extent, were only trying to mitigate you know, the, the uh, I, I guess, the, the worst aspects, or trying to say that they will accept neoliberalism but will provide, let's say, some forms of safety nets, you know, like providing for education or health, etc. I think when you look at what has happened, let's say, to the Labour Party in Britain or even to the Social Democratic Party in Germany, and to a certain extent, even the Democratic Party in the US, you know, um, it was a failure to recognize that there were many people who have seen themselves really left behind. You know? And therefore, to identify only with the uh, globalization of uh, people who are anywhere, you know? globalization means uh, action at a distance. So part of the image of the global person is the person who can go anywhere. Kaya ang dami tao who are somewhere. 
are, are located in particular places and often are left behind. So I think that is being recognized by, by, uh, by people who are committed to democracy and that if democracy is to be meaningful, you really have to address people who really see themselves as being left behind. Pero may ganang, di ba? Maski na sa Democratic Party sa US, di ba? Manabas yung mga grupo na gano'n lang Bernie Sanders, ang bawa, meron na halang mga Democratic Socialists, di ba? Ang tawag nila sa sarili na Democratic Socialists. So, in other words, populism need not be the, the uh, sole monopoly of the authoritarians on the right. Uh, you really also need the left to, to somehow address yung, that, that uh, that, that sense of uh, disenchantment no? and, and the real sense that we have been we have been left behind. No? But at the same time, how do you I have no answers by the way, no? but but uh, how do you do that also in a way that is still committed to pluralism and that's committed to human dignity without succumbing, let's say, to uh, yeah, temptations to to go the the route that is the simply a shortcut. No? Pero walang, uh, For our second and last round of asking questions, from the left, left side, yes. No. <laughs> from the center, the the the, the gentleman in green. Yes. At blue. My question is, um, what is the role or the importance that uh, theory can play in today's resistance to the authoritarian policies of the Duterte administration? And do you think that uh, besides practical action, i.e. rallies, protests, to resist the authoritarianism of the Duterte administration, address its roots and offer a real alternative, there should be in our uh, current era a uh, greater emphasis on theorizing, analyzing the uh, contemporary Filipino situation because um, when I was listening to your um, presentation, it seemed like um, it seemed almost like envious from like my perspective that the uh, martial law struggle during the 70s and the 80s, they were a very theoretically uh, rich um, and they offered lots of discussion on um, alternatives and because I, I agree with the previous question which which talked about the need for a greater economic critique, but I think that more than that, there should also be a need for a greater discussion on the need for a critique. Yeah, if that's all. Yes, I, I mean, I, I hope not that by presenting the situation, I mean, the, the situation this way of the past and also the present, that I was also being uh, an academic or presenting uh, alternative frames no? and, and the way to analyze. No? So, so yes, no, I think we, we do need that. And uh, I think that's the call you know, to political science students no? that, that part of our job really is to, to, I mean, to, crit to critique, no? to, to analyze. Uh, but at the same time, I guess the other side to it is also inspiration, right? That uh, there, is, there is a need to, to come together, there's a need to look at visions uh, and, and also to tell stories. No? So, and, and maybe because a lot of the challenges we face today are also very cultural. So they're not just political economic, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot has to do also with what gets to be taken for granted and what gets assumed no, in, in a climate where there is a lot of uh, know, fake news. No, no? Uh, but I think the, 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 all the more you need the more critical thinking or all the more you need the depth, no? depth of thought. No? Uh, at the same time, we need imagination, creativity. Diba, sabi nila, no, sa, in a world in which uh, there's a lot of artificial intelligence, diba, and, uh, and artificial intelligence can probably process information much more quickly than any, any, any one of us, no? and then we have ever, ever, ever to do. No? But, but at the same time, what do human beings have? No? Well, we have creativity. Uh, we have imagination that perhaps AI will not be able to replicate. And that's what we have to offer, no? and, and that's why I think, yeah, we need to take uh, political science seriously, and we need to take the social science seriously. For our, for our last question. And Mr. Uh, 
Uh, good morning, po, Dr. Tolosa. I'm Charles from UP Political Society, University of the Philippines, Dilema. So, sir, this is my question. What I can infer from your discussion is a maximalist definition of democracy, meaning uh, above the minimum requirement as said by Sean Peter and Paul, uh, by the most competitive popular elections, uh, competitive popular elections in terms of electing the most important political leaders of the country. But sir, this is my question. Given this, uh, some argues that Philippine democracy uh, is in its Pareto optimal state, meaning uh, this is what we can get now with all the elements that we have, like uh, political dynasties, uh, weak political parties, etc. Sir, what are your thoughts on these arguments? <laughs> But just to, to answer it directly, yes, no, a lot of, there's really what you have, a lot of imperfections, no? especially it of the, the genie to you know, institutions, even. but you really have to address you know, the, the, I mean, the, the reality of uh, the, the institutions no? and, and how rules also, but not just rules, but even, even the norms, you know? Have, have to address the, the, the imperfections of the situation, which are rooted also in structural uh, inequalities. So, so yes, at, uh, at, at some point uh, you have to you have to operate within those that kind of context. So that's why part of the analysis that needs to be developed is analysis that needs to be transformed in light of those in light of those uh, imperfections. <coughs> But of course, what, what I was trying to present, as you said, is a, is a vision of deepening of democracy you know, beyond its, uh, even its liberal democratic character to its more economic or social democratic character. Of course, you're saying that even the liberal democracy itself is in a context where what dominates is the really oligarchy rather than uh, democracy. So yes, so we have to face, face up to that you know, and, and, and examine the, the situation of the Philippines in that uh, in that context, but that is part of the democratization uh, challenge. Uh, whether or not I think we should just give up and say in this context there's no other choice but but to have some kind of uh, authoritarianism is is probably just uh, surrendering you know, to, to the situation. But I agree with you, you know, that that at some point you also have to look at how. Uh, democracy that we have is not really liberal democracy. And that's probably the reason why people are attracted to what seem to be much more authoritarian solutions. Because what they see is really not uh, genuine democracy or not even the possibility to participate further. So, so that's why at some level you really have to address the, I guess, the structural inequalities. That's why you have to address uh, lack of access to services, you have to address poverty. But you also have to address the more institutional questions you know, that, that uh, prevent, for example, rule of law from being, from being achieved. And sometimes how, and I think this is what uh, Gene has been uh, talking about, uh, many of the discussions that already have to do with changing the constitution did not even look at uh, what, what, need, what are the problems that need to be addressed in the first place. There are never no constitutional change that is being proposed without really look at, looking at what, uh, what the problems are and how particular kinds of changes in rules or institutions will address those problems. So yes, you need to agree in a way that you And all the more you need uh, uh, political science, all, right, all the more you need social science. Yes, thank you, Dr. Talosa. So, for Ms. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. And by way of showing our appreciation to Dr. Benjamin Hernando Tito Losa Jr. for his time and for his valuable contribution, we'd like to give this talk of appreciation to Dr. Benjamin Hernando Tito Losa Jr. The citation Association of Political Science Organizations of the Philippines, APSO. This plan of appreciation is presented to Dr. Benjamin Gerardo Tio Tolosa Jr. 
for kindly sharing his expertise to political science students and the larger public. As the speaker on Filipino social democracy and the struggle for democratization, history lessons for the present generation. During the second APSOP annual public lecture on political science, held on December 1, 2018, in the Ricardo and Dr. Isita Leong Hall Auditorium at the Mayo de Manila University, Quezon City. Signed, Ralph Gabriel D. Buella, Secretary General of APSOP, and Mina Grace Tirofanan, Deputy Secretary General of APSOP. To hand this part of appreciation to Dr. Tolosa, may we call on Mr. Ralph Buelia, Secretary General of APSO, and Ms. Nina Rafanen, Deputy Secretary General of APSO, and Ms. Paula Kini Bermudez, from the City of the District of APSO, to kindly come forward to award the APSO Club of Appreciation to Dr. Benjamin Gerardo Tolosa.
the status of Philippine democracy. The struggle for democratization is a continuous one. In order to move forward, we must be willing to revisit the past so as to learn from it. The challenge presented to us young political science students by Dr. Delosa is the challenge of whether we are willing to accept these historical lessons and use them in actively participating, deepening, consolidating, and defending the country's currently threatened democratization process. Now that we are almost finished with today's event, I would like to thank the following. First, I would like to thank Dr. Tadosa for accepting our invitation to speak on Filipino social democracy in the past of This public lecture would not have been as would not have been successful without his presence. Second, I would like to thank Professor Christian Torres Pilabil, Assistant Professor of Political Science in UP Diliman, for her invaluable support and guidance to the Office of Public Health in the Department. We could not have done it without your support. Third, I would also like to thank all the heads and members of the Office of Public Lecture Secretariat for your hard work in organizing this lecture and all the time and efforts you have included to make this lecture possible. Fourth, I would like to thank the staff of Dr. Tolosa's Office of the Associate for the work curriculum for all the assistance we got from the planning to the execution of this lecture. And last, I would like to thank everyone who participated in today's event. I hope that this lecture inspired each of you to engage in the process of protecting and enriching the democracy that generations before us fought for and we now enjoy. In closing, I would like to thank all of you and congratulations to all of us. Thank you, Mr. Panan, for the closing remarks. To our dearest guests, media partners, fellow students, and most of all fellow political science majors, words cannot describe how thankful we are for your active participation in making this APS of second annual public lecture a success. I hope that this morning's democratization lecture of Dr. Tolosa indeed empowered us political science majors to play a pivotal role in assessing our democracy and eventually safeguarding its institutions. I also hope that we all see each other again in next year's APSOF's third annual public lecture, where we again celebrate our discipline political science with a new topic and a new political science professor. Although we already had our closing remarks, we are not about to live this young hall yet, for we, are, we still have our photo opportunity. This is a rare opportunity to have our photos taken, not only with our speaker, Dr. Tolosa, but also this rare chance with all of us political science majors together. So may we invite Dr. Tolosa to come. We will follow this format for the photo opportunity. Please, 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 please